morning. Welcome to Advanced CAN Injection Techniques for Vehicle Networks by Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. Valasek, sorry. <laughs> he even talked about doing it too. Son. In Mandalay GH. Before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB. The, biz, uh, the Black Hat Arsenal is on and the Palm Foyer in level three, and of course the Arsenal receptions at 5 p.m. If you haven't picked up your merchandise today, it's your last day. Uh, you get Black Hat swag in the bookstore. Visit the Kali Linux Lab, Mandalay Bay A. And finally, thanks for putting your phones on vibrate. We don't want to hear that. With that, Charlie and Chris. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for uh, crawling out of your beds and making it here on time. Um, your favorite car hacker guys are back, looking more handsome than ever, if I do say so myself. Uh, we had some alternate titles for the talk. Uh, the first being uh, Make Andy Greenberg Cry Again. It was, it was kind of sad to see a grown man cry in a car on a highway. There's but some dispute whether he cried or not, but I think... He claims he didn't cry. He definitely cried. Uh, the other one was uh, Charlie found a guy on the internet who wasn't right about something. Shocker to most people. I know. I know. Uh, I was up for days. <laughs> just pulling your hair out. Uh, anyway, agenda. Uh, Let's go back to that guy wrong on the internet. <laughs> no, seriously. So, like, it's, it's a. People think that once you can send canned messages in a car, like, you're done, right? You've won. You can drive the car to LA or wherever you want. But as we're, you're going to see in this, if, if you don't know that already, that's not the case. There's still a lot of. Uh, hard work and and like techniques and stuff that that you need in order to get control of the the computers in the car. Yeah, and this is uh, our journey through that process. Uh, we'll, we'll go over car hacking quick and then go through uh, some prior research by by the academics and us, uh, and then talk about limitations we had on our previous attacks. While they were cool, we did have some limitations. Um, then we'll finally get into why these limitations existed, and that's because of a thing we call message confliction. Um, and then finally, we can talk about the new attacks we did and how we figured out to avoid this message confliction and actually be able to perform the types of attacks that we did before, but with less or no restrictions. Um, finally, we're going to talk probably for the 20th time about how you can harden these systems and, and make them more resilient to attack. Hopefully, it's not falling on deaf ears. And uh, then, then we retire. I think we're yep, done. We're done. We're done this after that. This is it. Enjoy, Enjoy it. Last time you'll see us up here. You can tell your kids you were in our last talk. <laughs> exactly. Moment in history. Uh, why can message injection is hey, important? Man, this is my slide, bud. After you. Thanks. So, um, like, you know, the talk is about can message injection, and so I guess let's understand why we care about can message injection. So the first thing to realize, and we'll go over this quick since a lot of you guys know this stuff, is that you've got a bunch of computers called ECUs in your car, Want some that do, like, I don't know, the spin or the, the dash or some that know if there's a passenger in the seat and some that control the power steering or whatever. And they all talk to each other on one or many buses, um, that, which have different protocols, but the most common one is CAN. So they're talking to each other. And what we did last year and what a, a typical kind of remote attack, which is the things we care most about, um, happen is you, you do some sort of exploit to get code running on one of these computers. And then you start to send messages from that computer to the other computers and try to get them to, to do something. Yeah, you're not remote, remotely hacking the brakes or acceleration, right? You're hacking an ECU that can speak to those things. Right, so maybe that's like OnStar, or in our case, it was the head unit that's connected to the internet, or maybe it's like something with Bluetooth or whatever. But step one is to get that code running. Step two is to send messages to the other computers. Um, but there's not like an easy way to make them like just do what, exactly what you want. So if you're, there's going to be a lot of printouts of canned messages in this talk, so just to, so you know what, what that's all about. Um, like CAN is a very simple protocol. The messages can have at most eight bytes of data. They all have an identifier. Uh, it's just broadcast everywhere. There's no sort of inherent source or destination. And uh, while this format is, is documented, the actual contents of the data is proprietary and changes from manufacturer to manufacturer. So, you know, the message for turn the steering wheel in the Jeep was much different than it was for the Toyota Prius, right? It depends who makes the car. Right. So this is what, like, a, a dump of, of CAM messages looks like. And it's just an example to see, like, you've got uh, an identifier, and then you've got some data. And this data, at first, is just bytes. We don't know what they mean. What's but this really cool format? I like this. Whose tool is this? Uh, that's our tool. Oh, man, that's really nice. Uh, what's, it? what's this one? Ecom Cat. Ecom Cat. 
All right. So anyway, great tool. Recommend it. It's it's available. You can download it. You know, um, the App Store. Uh, it's not in the App oh. Store, but uh, I'm not allowed to publish it. Yeah, store. you're not allowed to publish it there. So uh, anyway, you can see, and like just by playing around, you can figure out what these bytes are. Um, or you get a tool like Vehicle Spy, which makes it really easy. But anyway, the point is, you can see the first couple bytes are, in this case, the steering wheel angle. And this isn't like telling it what angle to make it. It's a report from the steering module what the current angle is. Um, and then you get some other things like uh, what gear you're in or what counter. And there's like all these messages floating around. And you just got to figure out what they are. And so that's what, that's what normal traffic looks like. You know, there's, there's tens of thousands of these messages flying all the time. Um, there's other kind of messages called diagnostic, and these sometimes you'll see during normal traffic or normal like driving conditions. But usually this is messages that you see when like a mechanic's working on your car. So a mechanic's plugged in, he's running some sort of tool to like you know fix something or query to make sure something what's broken in your car. And these messages follow a different, even more structured protocol um, called ISOTP and ISO 14229. And you can see here there's like sort of a challenge response going on and uh, here by the identifier you can kind of tell uh, who's talking to who and that sort of thing. Yeah, this is a more request response uh, protocol than just spitting messages out the bus. Right. And so again, while a lot of this is, is specified, still the actual data itself, you don't necessarily know what it means. You want to talk about yeah. these guys? Prior research. I don't know how many times we have to show this video, but cue it up again. Hit it. Check your uh, flag area. By sending their malicious code to the car. So you want to say who these guys are? Yeah, these are the researchers from the University of Washington and the University of California, San Diego. Uh, they were able to remotely compromise a car and uh, do a bunch of different things, such as uh, apply the brakes uh, and kill the engine and change the speedometer. But they were the first ones to remotely hack a car. Um, and so again, they followed the procedure. So step one, they remotely attacked. They had a couple ways to do that. OnStar and uh, they're very happy. OnStar and uh, that's Carl. Carl's awesome. Yeah, OnStar and Bluetooth, and then uh, another way which isn't quite as cool. And but so they remotely do that, and then they send cam messages to in, the, in that video lock up the brakes. Um, these attacks involve sending those diagnostic messages, right? Um, like I said, they could break, they could kill the engine. Um, there was no restrictions on these diagnostic messages, right? The car, as you saw, was kind of hurtling down that, that speedway, um, and they were able to send a diagnostic message, probably, what, reprogram some stuff or whatever, or send yeah, a diagnostic just... message to apply brake caliper That's what they said. one. Mm -hmm. um, we found out in later vehicles there were restrictions on when you can send these type of diagnostics. Right. So any car built at, in the la that we've encountered at least uh, built in the last five years, you can't do that anymore. You can't send diagnostic messages while the car is moving more than a few miles an hour, yeah. which is smart, right? Start this. All right. So he's afraid to touch the computer. I don't like the Max. I don't touch him. So here's here's us in 2013. Found a spot. Like we're gonna send some diagnostic messages and tell the brakes right. not to work. <laughs> now we're <up> <laughs> That's my favorite video. I yeah, I like to just hear Chris. That was the first time he ever did that. He's like, just start driving, I'm going to do something. And then the brakes didn't work and we went over the curb into the railroad tracks. So, I mean, that's fun. Uh, but the, the thing about that, again, like we use diagnostic messages like the academic guys did. Um, but that means now with those limits they put in, you can only do that. You notice we were only going like five miles an hour. Okay. So if he would have been driving a little faster, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, it's not that we were afraid. We were willing to die oh, in that car. We would have been day. driving like 30 miles uh, an hour. And you know, that, we're, we're, we're not soft. Um, but but they, there was some limitations. Uh, additionally, we started looking at uh, technology systems, right? These are right when cars were getting adaptive cruise control, braking assist, parking assist. Um, so, so we found that actually leveraging these systems was better than, than trying to do diagnostics because the messages were supposed to be seen when the car was running. Right. Since we couldn't send diagnostic messages and do what we wanted at speed, we, we had to look at these other ways, which involved using the normal CAN messages. So this is from uh, after the, the, the remote attack in the Jeep, we were able to do some stuff no, like this. I'm not touching anything. I like yeah, how the head, head unit crashes. Now. Yeah, head unit rebooting. Ooh, steering. So we could control the steering here. La this is from last year still. Don't hit the poles. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice again, right. like, <laughs> while we're right using normal year. messages there, uh, <laughs> we're pocket. driving very slow. And that's yeah. because this attack we're still doesn't work. Right by it. <laughs> All right, there it is. Um, so that attack still didn't work, 
at speed, more than a few miles an hour, because we did some trick we'll talk about in a minute where we use diagnostic messages in order to set it up to where we could then send normal messages. So at last year, go ahead. Want to talk yeah, uh, it, it was uh, so. So what we did there uh, was uh, we were able to kind of try to impersonate uh, ECUs, right? So instead of uh, sending a diagnostic and then then another diagnostic, it was send a diagnostic to kind of turn off a ECU and then impersonate it, start sending traffic that that it normally would have been sending. Uh, the the hard part of this uh, and the reason we needed to do this was message confliction resulted in systems being turned off. Uh, for example, uh, say. The, the parking assist module said the steering wheel angle should be at zero, and we just flooded the CAN bus and said, no, it should be at 90 degrees. Um, it knew that something went wrong and actually turned that feature off. So the attacks that we kind of did on the Prius, uh, where we just flooded the bus and hoped for the best, didn't work because the systems were smart. Right. So you, you can imagine that this is happening, right? There's the, you, you might think that the computers just send messages once in a while, but in real life what happens is the computers periodically are sending messages all the time. Yep. And so, for the steering example, there is a computer and it's always saying, don't turn the wheel, don't turn the wheel, don't turn the wheel. And so, when we say turn the wheel, uh, this, the, 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 the steering computer gets these two types of messages, right? And it's like, what's it gonna do? Like, I don't, you know, it has yeah. to decide what to do. And what it does in the Jeep, and probably many other cars, is that it says, fuck this, I'm done. Yep. I'm, 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 Peace, I'm out. I'm no, turning no off. I'm, for you. Yeah, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, too bad. And so that's why we couldn't turn the wheel at speed last year. And also, like, one of the reasons that I was interested in this is we gave a talk after we did the, the Ford and the, the Prius stuff a long time ago. This was like two or three years ago in front of a bunch of automotive industry people. And we were talking about, oh, how we did this or we did that. And there were people in the audience that were just like snickering and like whispering to each other yeah. the whole time. And we're like, what's, what's the deal? And they're all like, oh yeah, well we, you know, our car wouldn't do that. Yeah. Like ours would never do that because we, we would, we would yeah. notice it. Like, oh no, the system turns off. You can't trick it. Right. And so we're like, anytime anyone snickers, it's like, a, no. yeah, okay. We waited for them in the parking lot, beat the crap out of right. them. Right. <laughs> yeah. We did both of those. We did that and, and we're going to show how. And to. now we do this. Right. Warrior philosophers. <laughs> Hackers. Uh, yeah. So anyway. It, it, we, we really needed to do these diagnostic messages to make anything interesting happening. But at the same time, these didn't work at speed. So we only had videos of us doing it at slow speeds. Right. So if you weren't paying attention, you thought we did everything last year, but we really didn't. So this is like basically was the state of the art of injecting cam messages, uh, you know, before a, an hour from now. <laughs> so uh, when the academics did on their 2009 car, they were able to do brakes, uh, whatever they wanted. Um, they didn't have any steering control, but not because they didn't, they weren't smart enough. It's just their car didn't have that functionality. It didn't have the way for computers to control the steering because it, it was too old. Um, and then they didn't do like acceleration yep. or anything. But if you see all the yellow here, right, there's one anomaly, which was we could uh, engage the brakes on the Prius anytime we wanted. It, its pre-collision system wasn't very smart about which message it received, so we could always brake. But other than that, there's a bunch of yellow, which means all these cool attacks required the car to be going less than five miles an hour or so. So in reality, while there you know, is a big attack surface, the actual application of attacks up until today have been the car had to be going slow. All right. While everyone's been freaking out about car hacking, how dangerous it is, in reality, if you had a car built since 2010, there was no real like physical risk to yeah. it. it was like, At least someone didn't prove it yet. Yeah. So like, you know, yeah, if someone's going to hack you and turn on your windshield wipers. Go ahead. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. And as uh, Michael Osman said, uh, activating windshield wipers is the hello world. Car hacking, that's true, right? We can do a bunch of cool stuff and we can do it at speed, but like, who really cares if we can flick your lights or turn your windshield wipers on? It's right. a nice parlor trick, but I don't think it actually has a, a huge safety impact. When Chris is saying it's a nice parlor trick. Yeah, exactly. He, My whole he, life's a parlor trick. He's the king of parlor tricks. So, <laughs> yeah, so like, we want to do more. We want to see, like, it, we need to understand what attacks that would affect physical systems look like so that we can then defend against them. Yeah. Now don't get us wrong, there are times when you can have uh, conflicting messages and the system still does what you want it to do. Right. So yeah, the breaking in the Prius he mentioned happened in 2012 was like that. So the, it, the, it got conflicting messages, the regular computer saying don't turn on the brakes, uh, us saying turn on the brakes, and I guess it decided like, well, I better play better it safe. Better safe than sorry, yeah. Right, I'll apply the brakes. So there's a similar situation on the Jeep with acceleration. So uh, the way that, that the Jeep's cruise control works is there's a computer on the steering column 
and uh, the buttons on the steering column to control the 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 cruise control. You press it, and every time you press it, it sends a CAN message to uh, the engine or to to accelerate or decelerate or whatever. Yeah. Um, and the thing that makes this not have confliction is it's not saying all the time like cruise controls off, cruise controls off, cruise controls off, and then I'm like no, it's on, and then it's like no, it's off. Like that would be bad. The way it actually works is buttons not pressed, buttons not pressed. Buttons pressed, buttons not pressed, and that makes sense. That's how buttons yeah. work, right? <laughs> they like buttons are either pressed or they're not, right? And so, like, while the steering column is constantly saying the button's not pressed, I can, as an attacker, say button was pressed for a second, and then it's like, oh shit, someone just turned on. Yeah, control. look, oh, I got to speed up. Yeah, so so we can do this attack without confliction. It's very easy. So uh, let's watch. So we're gonna make the car accelerate. Um, notice there's no driver. Ghost driver, ghost riding the whip. So we're, out, we're out here in the, in the cornfields of Missouri. <laughs> it's a pretty safe place yeah. to go do car hacking. Um, so you can see right now, if you look up there, we're going three miles an hour. I just turned and on the cruise we're control. Off. And we're now off. we're accelerating away. Said past Chris. Yeah, we're safe. We're good. <laughs> so you can look into the speedometer. Now we're doing like 35 or something. 40. Yeah, we, we got uh, to like 40 40 miles an hour. I'm going to hit the brakes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's me panicking, dropping my phone. Yeah, we didn't crash. Uh, yeah. it's just him freaking and out. And you would ask, why would you do it with no driver? And we asked, why wouldn't you? And how do you stop the car? You pull the emergency brake, and the car s slows down. Yep. So, and that's, that's why you do it in the cornfields of Missouri. Right. No, it, it's a. Uh, you notice the academic researchers? They were on a test track with a helmet, and we got a lot of criticism last year for not being safe enough with Andy. Yeah. This year we were safer. We wore sunglasses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> got, got to protect the UV, man. Yeah, man. Your eyes are valuable. Yeah, you know it. Go ahead, buddy. All right, so, um, so that's fun. Let's talk about some more stuff. Uh, so last year, after we, we gave our talk, Chrysler patched everything and fixed things up, which was awesome. That's why we did it. Like, you know, well done. They did a great job of that. Um, but the one sort of hindrance that it, it causes to a researcher is their fix actually caused us problems in, in wanting to examine the head units more. So. Let's see why. So the first thing, they, they fixed it in, in a lot of different ways. Um, the first thing they did was they made a, a recall. And so that means you're supposed to take your car in and get it fixed or whatever, which not many people probably did. Nope. Um, the other thing they did was they emailed out, or email, they, they mailed uh, USB sticks to people. And then the person was supposed to update their car with that, which uh, yeah. probably I, not. I the, assume the, a lot of those went in the trash. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would just plug in a random USB stick into my car. I would. I'm a risk taker. Yeah, well. You're, you're, yeah, you are. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so that, so that was to fix the actual vulnerability that would allow us you know, to excuse me, remotely attack the car. But the problem with that was that there's still going to be a ton of cars out there that aren't fixed, right? Because people aren't going to get them fixed up right away. Um, so the other thing they did, which was really smart, was uh, they went, it was a great idea we had. Yeah, um, shocking. <laughs> Two geniuses came up with it. Yeah, uh, but anyway, uh, we, 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 there's enough credit for everyone. <laughs> uh, so the other thing they did was they contacted Sprint, who was the cellular carrier that the car used to, to get on the internet. And they blocked all the incoming traffic to the cars. Yep. So then we couldn't, even if the car had that vulnerability, we couldn't send the traffic to it anymore. Yeah. To, to Th This had the biggest impact, right? We could no longer uh, connect to port 6667 and do that debus stuff and compromise head unit. This actually made uh, the vulnerability, you know, kind of right. go away. Yep. And the amazing thing about this is this means that they didn't need to ever have traffic going to the car. So it's not like they had to just fix the vulnerability or, or block that service, block that one port. It's like, oh no, we never even yeah. needed to talk to Like, well, you didn't talk to Steve down in network engineering? And he's like, what, what? Oh, shit. Hold on. Yeah, no, turn it all off. That was a bad idea. Like, yes, it was. It was a terrible idea. So anyway, that was, that's the most uh, you know, impactful fix they did. But the one other thing that they needed to do was what about Wi-Fi? So the cars can have Wi-Fi as well. And that was if, if the port was still available there, we could have still exploited it. So the way they fixed that was uh, they just instituted some sort of business logic that said when you, so the Wi-Fi is not free. You have to actually pay for it. The internet connection was free. But the Wi-Fi you have to pay for, and they made it to where when you buy it, it checks the version of the, the software running on the head unit, and if it's uh, not up to date, they don't let you buy it. And so there was like some time period of like 30 days when maybe you could have had the Wi-Fi running um, and it, on a vulnerable head unit, but not anymore. And so that's another way that you can't you can't send the the, the attack anymore to any of the cars. So that was cool. So so that was fun. Um, the bad news for us as researchers is like we want to examine the code on the head unit and play around and check to see if patches work and all that kind of stuff. And the way we used to do that was we took advantage of this little bug that was in the software 
um, that was like super cute, I thought. So basically they had some backdoor in their, their, their code that they were checking. That, so they do some authentication, it's gotta be signed and all this kind of stuff like you would hope. But there's this one little check where they're like, oh, well if the 10th byte is an S, then we just, we just let you do it. So, uh, so that's the- what, a feature, not a bug. Uh, it's a great feature, I love it. Um, and so the way we used to get code run, like a shell on the head unit just to play around, was we would, we would take advantage of this bug, and the code we would get it to run is we would start an SSH daemon, and we would, you know, SSH in, and everything was cool. But because they, uh, they turned off the Wi-Fi on this version of the head unit, we couldn't do that anymore. So it's like, well, I still want to play with the head unit version I know. Researchers I, want to research. I know. I, I have all my item databases for this version and stuff, right? Yeah. So I was like, bummer. So we were like, had to find a new way to do it. And shout out to Brian Rose for this. He did a lot of the, the heavy lifting on this. But it turns out there was some code, and it's like, it has a check where if you have a very particular uh, USB adapter and you plug it in, it automatically starts SSH and you can connect to it. <laughs> which, is, which is cool, right? Um, Feature. So, Right, so you go and you buy this exact thing, it's like 30 bucks or whatever, you plug it into your, your USB slot on your Jeep, and then all of a sudden you have an SSH connection. But you don't have uh, uh, an account or anything, right? Aw, oh, man. And that's a drag. But because we already previously had seen the firmware, we knew what the, the, um, you know, the hash of the of root's password was. Yeah. But, um, so then you just crack it. And this is our password, DT Donkey. Yeah. And I, I'd like to know what the DT Donkey like inside joke is. I know, man. Yeah, you know, like, ah, if someone knows, come tell us because yes. we want to have a chuckle. Off the record, I just want to know, yeah. what's up with the DT Donkey? Oh, yeah. All my passwords are DT Donkey now. I know. I'm from my banking size, DT Donkey 1. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, that's you good know. So anyway, so now you can get a shell. Everything's good. That's just like, has nothing to do with our talk. It's just yeah. sort of fun, fun little side note. Yeah, a little something. Anytime you know a secret password, you got to have yeah, a yeah, talk. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so now let's talk about what we did. Yeah, and most people don't realize that a lot of this work is just reverse engineering firmware blobs, right? This is like a vast majority of the work. I mean, the videos are great, and they're, and they're great for people to see because it kind of gives them some perspective, but honestly, it's just sitting in front of IDA Pro for endless hours, right? That's the non-sexy part of car hacking. Yeah, and the hard part, too, about car hacking is that you're not looking at, except the head unit, but which we don't care about this, this year, um, the ECUs are running some, you know, weird architecture on some weird chip and in like some real-time operating system. So it's not like Linux on an x86 computer or yeah. something. There's no strings. There's no exports. There's no imports. There's no lookup tables. Like it's just a binary blob, and you have to pick the right architecture and then infer stuff from there. Yeah, it's hard so, to get started. And we want to say like, hey, what does this thing care about RPMs or speed or how does it do diagnostics? What CAM messages is it interested in? We basically just want to figure all this stuff out. Right. And it takes a lot of time. Yeah, I mean the basic questions we have are like, okay, if, if the steering won't turn when you're driving 60 but it will at 5, like why? Why is that the case? Right. Yeah. How do they check that? Like, you know, what checks are made and, and can we circumvent that somehow? Yeah. And we made assumptions before but why have an assumption when you can look through the code and know definitively? Uh, little tips. Uh, we had to guess some, some of the processor types before because we couldn't get them out of the car. Um, so for the power steering control module, it was like we just went to Renaissance's site and started going through all their architectures and they're like, oh, this one says it may be used for steering. You download the data sheet, you look at the memory mapped I.O., you try it in your IDB, and after doing that a couple times, lo and behold, we figured out what it was. Uh, so some of it is just guessing the right stuff and trying. I, I think that's called skill. Oh, yes. I forgot about that. I don't have very much of it. Um, known knowns, right? So we had the mechanics tool, and those mechanics tool have secret byte values that are used for things like security access, which is a diagnostic, right? So you look for those constants in the firmware, and if you can find some cross-references and, and look at the code, you'll say, hey, this looks like it's checking for this value. Uh, I can infer from that that's a diagnostic routine, and then you work your way back up the call chain to figure out what happens. That's why it's called reverse engineering and not forward engineering. Oh, you see? I always wondered why. Don't that. drop some knowledge today. Yeah. So People I mean, learn something. You get this huge blob and you have no idea what any of the functions do, and all you care about is like the one function that deals with, yeah. uh, you know, CAM messages that have to do with speed. Yeah. But it's like, how do you find that? And exactly. so these kind of tips are what get you to the right. And remember place. too, it has all the code for actually doing car stuff that we don't give a shit about. We just want to know about what it's doing on CAN and how we can manipulate it. Um, everything's a different the same. We looked through several architectures. V850 and PowerPC uh, were, were pretty uh, predominant on the Jeep. Uh, sometimes you'll have data structures that hold CAN values. Sometimes they'll be hard-coded in 
the disassembly. Uh, many times there's an array for the memory mapped I.O. Other times it directly accesses the memory mapped I.O. So right. nothing was ever the same, even if we had the same architecture. And then the thing that really makes it hard is nothing is ever coded as I would have coded it, right? Like, we're used to writing code and we don't give a shit about how much memory it takes or yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, this was written by some dude who used some to Some old a, gray beard in the, in, that hasn't left the job since the 60s, right. I assume. He's like some old mainframe programmer or something. And so it's like, yeah. why would you do that in like 10 different arrays and all this stuff? But whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it yeah. Makes it kind he of actually hard. has to worry about memory instead of just putting it up there. I know. Um, base address, remember, I think this is important always in reverse engineering, but like, find, especially for these, because we are so heavily dependent, uh, on, on cross references to different memory regions, if you don't have the base of your disassembly right, it's gonna be bad times for you, and you're not gonna find what you want. You may see things that look like what you want, but they're gonna be incorrect. Um, luckily, yeah, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Yeah, right? l luckily for us, uh, you can find that, uh, you can sniff the CAN bus using Ecomcat, best tool out there, I think. Uh, or secondly, the mechanics tool actually had, uh, it was all in Java, so we could just uh, actually create a Java program, feed it a, a firmware file, and it would tell us what the base address would be. Obfuscated Java. Obfuscated JavaScript. We'll get to that later. Uh, as I said, our approach, find CAN registers, right? Find CAN IDs. Basically, what is it doing with CAN? And we know the CAN IDs because we can sniff the bus and record them. And, you know, we found out before that this is this, what, O2, E4, whatever, that's speed. So maybe if we find that value, it's doing something with speed, right? Um, finally, we, uh, there, there's a lot of checksums used and, and diagnostic routines. Again, those are kind of constants. We can identify functions that make a checksum pretty easily. Uh, you just search for XOR as an instruction and then find all those cross-references and figure out which one is actually doing a checksum. Yeah, like 80% of the XORs in an ECU is for checksum. Purposes. Yeah, someone's like, how did you find it? I was like, well, I looked for the XOR instruction, then I went through all 2,000 of them. <laughs> That's Simple. pretty much what we do. Yeah, yeah, it's easy. And so this is what like things look like in Ida Pro. It's all cool. Um, I don't think we're going to yeah. yeah. Now, and this is the PAM, right? This is how we found the, the, the parking checksum assist stuff. Module. What's that? We we're supposed to define oh, our... Sorry, parking assist module. Um, you know, this is how we found the checksum algorithm, and we knew checksums were the last byte in the CAN payload, so cross-reference to this function, right? Then you're going to say, okay, I assume they care about a checksum. It's probably doing CAN parsing. So uh, it's, it, it takes a long time. Additionally, we talked about these arrays that hold, uh, uh, you know, uh, a pointer to memory mapped I.O. You can see all the cross-references. Oh, those are a lot of good function names there. That's, uh, those are definitely Charlie Miller's, because I use some capital letters in mine. Yeah, those are mine. Um, but basically you say, okay, here's the array that, that points to memory mapped I.O., right? Everything that touches that, probably doing can stuff. Um, then finally you can dump the mechanics tool, especially easy when it's in Java, uh, because, you know, you can just decompile it. Uh, what's crazy, though, is they obfuscated the whole thing, um, uh, so you couldn't read it. I think they messed up what the difference between obfuscation and encryption, because I started to go through these. I was like, oh, man, it does an SSH connection. I wonder if they use a password. Luckily, they didn't. They were using keys, um, but also their private keys were just a string in the program, too. So. Right. So uh, if you, you can know, just go log in and like I get all the firmware. Yeah, Maybe write firmware. I don't know because that sounds like breaking law, and I wouldn't do that. We don't do that. So yeah, but if if you ever want to know how your car or the mechanics get the the, the firmware updates, they SSH into uh, the server the, the Chrysler servers with these keys. So yeah, feel free firmware, to feel so. free to do that. Yo, get yourself some firmware. Got it. All right. So. Um, the first thing that we were like, okay, well, you know, we're reverse engineers, so we'll just start, we'll flash the new firmware on the steering module and tell it to steer, right? What could be easier Easy than breezy. that? Easy breezy. Um, so you got to understand how the update mechanism works, so to do that, you basically let the mechanics tool do it and see what it does. Um, it's mostly pretty standard stuff. Uh, it, it, like, puts in diagnostic mode, does the security access thing, which is supposed to stop regular people like us from doing that, but we have all the secrets, so it doesn't stop us. Um, and then they do some, some thing that we don't understand, but if you just do it, it works. Um, and then they, they send some routine control to it. They erase the firmware, and then they use sort of a, a, a standard kind of way to, to transfer the new data. Um, and then the one little secret thing is they do this, other, this routine control with a checksum. And if the checksum doesn't work, then it won't load that, that firmware. And then they reset, everything's good. So that, the only thing that's going to stop us is this little checksum, right? So let's see what it, what it does. Um, so this is what an update looks like. Um, happening, and you can see like it's doing its thing, and then this is the last one. It does a checksum. The so checksum here is like CD5D. It's the blue letters, if you can see the blue. 
Um, and then the response back is uh, 71, which is good. So this is what it looks like when things are good. If you send in the wrong checksum, then you get back a, an error response that the error code is general programming failure. So if you don't know the checksum, it won't let you update that firmware. But again, it's not like a cryptographic signature or something. It's yeah. just two bytes, right? And so if you want, you can just try to brute force that. So uh, we did. Um, and so basically I just left my car running for out in my driveway for like a day. Save the planet. Yeah, man. One, one car at a time. That's all you can do. <laughs> and so, uh, like, it was quite fun. So I would just walk out there every couple hours, like, oh, did it, did it find the checksum yet? Yeah. It's like, nah, not yet. And then my computer was overheating because it was, like, hot and stuff. And so I was like, oh, I know uh, how to solve this problem. So I put my, my computer on the, the passenger seat and I turned on the vented seat. There you go. So it blows like air conditioning right on the computer. It's like a supercomputer inside <laughs> of my car. And then af after like, you know, nine hours or something, it found it yeah. and then it was fine. So that so computer's the worst. It's that, the absolute worst. That computer. You're going to hear in these videos, you're going to hear this like loud buzzing noise. It's this piece of shit computer. It's terrible. It's, it's fine. That computer is one four pwned owns and hacks like it, three cars. It's time to retire it as well. Yeah, I guess. Is there like, some sort of museum for old computers. I don't want to just throw it away. <laughs> anyway, so so we could have done this, right? So we we showed you can brute force that and, and do it, but like it's not an ideal experience, right? Um, not to mention the gas. Like I was almost afraid I was going to run out of gas because I only had like a quarter tank. I was like, <laughs> how long could a car idle? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It doesn't take much gas, but it does eventually use some. Um, so this is a bummer because every time you make a change to the firmware. Uh, you would have to redo this checksum, which again is nine hours or whatever. And that's fine if you know exactly what you're doing and you, you know, have an actual like environment. But we're just updating bytes in a binary blob. There's a very good chance that we mess that up. Right. So we're gonna probably, for one thing, brick the car, and for another thing, uh, have to make changes and have my car running nonstop for weeks, which I didn't want to do. No thanks. So like, worst case, we would have done this, but we found like, like, let's see if there's an easier way to do it. Let's see if we can just do it purely by canned messages. Yeah. yeah. Want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, we talked before about what we call message confliction, right? Uh, what happens when the attacker is sending a message and the real ECU is sending that same message and the values conflict? Uh, answer, it depends on the system and the vehicle. So uh, if you see here, the car is going zero, right? It's going nowhere. We're telling it it's going 40, but it's getting messages saying it's going zero and it's going 40. So you see it kind of going up and down there because the messages are conflicting. Now, the speedometer isn't broken or doesn't respond, it just doesn't really know what the speed is. Right, and, and you can solve this problem by just sending more messages uh, faster that say yeah. 40. We purposely sent them kind of slow so you could see that it's kind of fighting with itself. Yeah, you can flood the bus and get it to do your speed exactly. So that's what confliction kind of looks like in, in the real world, but uh, for speedometers and simple stuff. But for real things like braking or steering, this is what it looks like. Uh, So we're going to just tell it to turn, the, or turn on the brakes, I think. Yeah. We're going to try to use the adaptive cruise control to activate the brakes. And if you look here at the screen, you'll see it actually say that the adaptive cruise control system is unavailable, and you see that light lights up, right? What that means is it got conflicting messages, um, but it was like, nope, I give up. I don't want to do this, and I'm going to turn that system off. So you can't just flood the bus. Uh, you mess up once, you're screwed. Right. All it takes is one message that conflicts and it turns the system off. Well, in most ECUs, yeah. you'll see that's not always the case. So we uh, invented message unconfliction, trademark pending. Uh, what we want to do is ensure that only our messages are received. Um, and, and how do you do this? You could trick the receiving ECU, uh, or you could stop the real ECU from sending messages and then pick up where it left off. Uh, the last thing that you could do is you could have some device plugged in here that would invalidate messages as it saw them, but that would require physical access. Now, while we were plugged in for this research, all these attacks are applicable, ap applicable from a remote standpoint. It's not that, that you couldn't do these remote, it's that we didn't find another, we didn't even look for another remote bug because we knew it was possible. Right. Um, so yeah, so let's first talk about how you can trick uh, ECUs, and then we'll, we'll go on to the second step next. So the first thing is uh, if you read the the assembly for the, the steering module, which is the one we care the most about. You can watch the code that, that checks the messages that come in. And you'll notice this third byte, it looks like some sort of counter that's increasing, right? Um, and so the, what it does in the actual code is it checks and it's, if it sees two messages in a row that have that same counter value, 
then it sets some sort of flag that says, like, I think I saw a duplicate message. Yeah. And if it sees more than, like, three or four or five, I forget the exact number, of these duplicate messages in a row, then it turns itself off. Yeah. But if it sees just one or two bad mess like messages that it thinks are, are duplicates, and then it gets the next one, and the next counter value, then it's like, oh, sweet, everything's back to normal. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm going to keep going. So using this, the way that that works, you can actually trick it into only listening to your messages. We and call this counter buster trademark pending. <laughs> I think Chris calls it this. <laughs> so uh, you'll see here, this is like real uh, traffic. Uh, the green messages are the ones the attacker are sending, and the red ones are the ones that the real module, the parking assistant module, are sending. And what I do is I just make sure to time the messages, and you can do this by reading the bus. There's not, not any luck involved. So that my messages always show up right before uh, the, the same, or a message with the same counter value as, uh, as the bad message. And so you see in the first one, it's like zero is my value for counter, and then, so it, it reads it, and then it gets the message that's in red with the val value zero, and the code is like, oh, uh, I already saw this one, I can ignore it, but I'm gonna pay attention, if there's any more bad ones, I'm gonna turn myself off. And then it gets the next green one, counter value one, it's like, oh sweet, Back to everything's more. good again, uh, I'm gonna read this message, and then it gets the bad one, or it gets the, the real one, the, the one that's actually good, and it's like, oh, this is the duplicate, throw it out, but I'm gonna be, pay attention, and so on. And so in the end, it only reads the green ones, which are ours, and it ignores all the red ones, which are the real ones. Yeah. So essentially what we're doing is we're beating the ECU at its own job, right? We're just doing it in a time fashion that, that makes our messages work instead of the real messages. Right, and in the end, this is the only thing that we told Chrysler they should fix, is uh, not let you do that. Yeah, um, so, so that's one trick. That's one, that's one trick. But we said before that we actually wanted to completely stop the ECU from sending the messages, right? Because that way we could impersonate it. And before, we could only do that at slow speeds, right? Because we, uh, it, it saw that it was going too fast, and then it won't actually get us into diagnostic mode. But now we can forge the speed, right, reliably, and then throw the ECU into... Uh, uh, boot ROM mode, or diagnostic mode, and then put it in boot ROM mode, basically reprogramming itself. Um, so why do we want to put it in boot ROM mode to reprogram itself? Before, when we would put uh, the ECU in diagnostic mode and then speed up again, it would actually say, oh, uh, we're going fast, I'm going to kick back to the application firmware I have and I'm going to do what I do. But if you're actively reprogramming it, there's no application firmware to go to. Right? So it just can't do anything, so it's gonna follow our messages now. Right. So basically we start reprogramming the ECU, and like halfway through we stop, and then we drive. And at that point, or you know, you can, you, you can imagine the attack, like the car stopped, we, we do that, and then the victim drives off, or whatever. But the point is, once you start driving, there's no way it can recover and go back to normal mode, which is what it used to do. Um, because like, what's it gonna do? It has no code, yeah, right? Exactly. It has no valid code it can even run. And so here's what this looks like if you're watching traffic. So um, yeah. we can, you can see the traffic on the, on the upper right, and then I, I start reprogramming it, and you'll notice that the traffic stops because that, that ECU is being reprogrammed. It can't send its normal traffic anymore. Um, and that's true whether we're, we're now driving at speed or not. So that's the way that you, you can shut down the one that's sending, and then you, you can just take over for it and start sending messages exactly. for it. So this is a way you could actually get the ECU to be uh, taken offline, um, and then we can impersonate it, and then when we're done, we can finish reprogramming it so the ECU actually isn't bricked, right? It'll actually get the real firmware on there, we just took it offline for a little bit. Right, so this is the way that we deal with confliction uh, and are able to do things at speed. Good. All right, so... Uh, the first thing that we, can, we figured out to do is put the power steering control module, the one that does the steering, into diagnostics while you're driving uh, fast, which you shouldn't be able to do. In fact, uh, Chrysler's so paranoid that you're going to put the, the steering into diagnostic mode like when you're not supposed to, you can't even do it with the car uh, running. So they have code in there that checks if, you ha if the car's even running, you can't do it. The car has to be like off or you know, on with the engine not on, whatever that's yeah. called. Zero RPMs, right? right. The, so, the so, internal combustion engine isn't running. Right, and so uh, we're able to go beyond that. Not only is the car running, but it's actually driving on the highway, and yep. we, can, we can turn this on. And the way we do this is we fake the RPMs using that trick we, we showed where we, we uh, send in the messages right before the, the real messages. We fake the RPMs, we fake the speed, um, and then we, we put it in diagnostic mode, and it's like, because remember, the steering, it doesn't really know how fast you're going. It only knows because it's receiving messages telling it. So if you can trick all those messages, you can make it think it's, going, it's not even on 
uh, the, the engine's not even on, and then you can put in diagnostic mode. And the physical result of that is, is you just, you can turn the steering wheel, but it's like super hard. It's, uh, you know. Extremely difficult to steer. Right. Even these big muscles cannot turn it. So, uh, there's, you know, there's like motors and, and stuff to, to yeah. turn it, and those are all off. And you, you have to not only turn against the, the, the car itself, but you have to fight against all those motors that aren't, aren't on. Let's show them an example. Okay. Wow. And I'm diesel, man. I'm pretty strong. So I figure this might be so easy. He's going to try to make a turn here, but he can't. So he ends up like up on the curb as usual. <laughs> I've driven a car without power steering. It's more difficult th than that. It's very, very difficult to, to try to steer the car. Right. So anyway, so that's bad. You shouldn't probably be able to do that. Um, agreed? Anyone? Concur. Okay. Right. okay. So uh, that's one thing is, is you can do diagnostic sessions at speed, which you shouldn't be able to do. Um, then the next thing was, let's see if we can engage the brakes at speed. Um, so the way we do that is there's, you know, the, there's the emergency parking brake module is normally sending messages saying not to engage itself. And then there's this confliction problem. So the way we deal with that is we knock the parking brake offline using this like reprogramming halfway trick. Um, and then we send messages that say like, everything's fine. And we're like, oh, turn on the brakes. Yep. And then they turn on. Yeah. So. so here you go. And how do you know, Charlie, that you're not actually just applying the brakes in the car? There's no way you can know that. Well, there may be one way. No. So, I mean, you, you can't, I mean, that's the whole thing about these demos. It's like, you don't know tricks. if we're lying or not. Right. Maybe I just made it all up. <laughs> so, we tried to figure out how we could do this, and Charlie said, I'll just drive up with my feet outside the window. <laughs> so if you look, there's no I, way I could have applied the brakes because yeah. I don't even have... Also, in brakes. front of him, there's a chain link fence, and I was really hoping I'd get video of him going right through the fence. Yeah, well, I would not have done that. I would just bail out the window. <laughs> so I was going to be fine. That was my plan B. Yeah. But yeah, so you can see, we're, you, know, you can drive whatever speed, you can apply the brakes uh, to the car, which is you shouldn't be able to do, and it's kind no. of unsafe. Um, so this is just a fun little trick about like reprogramming things halfway, is uh, with the parking brake, you can tell it to apply the parking brake, right? And so it puts these calipers or something on, on the actual brake mechanism. Yep. And then you, you reprogram the parking brake halfway and you stop. And then what happens is the parking brake doesn't work, but it's engaged and so you're stuck, yeah. right? So sure. let's see what it looks like. This is one of my favorites because essentially you put the parking brake on, brick the ECU, and your par parking brake is perma on right. forever. Because it's electronic, right? Off. So the parking, that's the parking brake. It doesn't do anything. I can't drive. go. Can't it's, really go anywhere. So now I'm, I'm like punching. I'm accelerating as hard as possible. You can see the RPMs are like way up. It's not good for the but car. I'm not it's really not moving. Good. Only able to turn it off. No. I feel sorry for whoever gets this Jeep after you. Yeah, it's kind of a piece. It's, it's, it's seen like, better days. So then we're just showing that you can even reboot like the car. It smells like success. Uh, like <laughs> you, can, you can smell the brakes. Yeah, I just smell burnt parking brake. Yeah. So, but anyway, there's nothing you can do. And like, you know, like we were able to then reprogram okay. the thing to get it back to normal, but like a normal person wouldn't be able to do that. And a mechanic probably wouldn't know to do that. They'd probably just replace it. Yeah. Yeah, that thing's going to the, the shop in a flatbed. <laughs> just rock into the e-brake. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Anyway, go ahead. Um, then, you know, I think the, the, the biggest one was steering, right? We, we showed before we had to steer at low speeds. And actually, when we did our demo, it was just reverse, I think, too, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but... This is kind of the, the, the most concerning one, right? If you can turn the steering wheel uh, as the car is going an arbitrary speed, then that ends up being pretty dangerous. So, right. And so, and the trick is the same stuff, right? We put the pan and boot around mode. We do that fake counter trick. Um, and then we, we become the, the parking assist module and we tell it, turn the wheel. Like, you're, you need to park right now. And it's like, okay. So, here's a, a video of that. And uh, the wheel turn, if you if you don't have like the death grip on, is actually pretty significant. So, <laughs> so you can see the skid marks there. So yeah, it turns pretty hard. Like you could, if you knew it was coming, you could you're, probably yeah. overpower it. But who's driving like at two and ten with a death grip unless you're right. Andy Greenberg? If, if you're not, yeah. And he, yeah, <laughs> I didn't go say anything about that. So here's some other views. This is more cornfield shots. All right, ready? three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, so we got the Jeep stuck in the ditch. So Charlie and I are like, well, I guess we'll get on Twitter. Yeah. And we just sat there for uh, half an hour because it was completely stuck. We had to call a tow truck. Yeah, tow trucks are all like, it'll be three hours. It's yeah. like, oh, well, I guess we'll just sit here and tweet. Yeah. So uh, we were stuck. You can see on the road, there's pretty significant uh, skid. 
But luckily, we're in the heartland of America, and some locals with their pickup found us and stopped. They said, do you need out of there? We said, yeah. And he said, 10 bucks. I said, okay. <laughs> Best ten dollars. Best ten dollars ever spent. Yep. So uh, they were nice enough to tow, tow the jeep out, and uh, they were very discreet people. Like, how'd you guys end up in the ditch? We're like, we'd rather not say. Okay. So they, yep. All right. You gotta love them. I, yeah, I gotta gotta appreciate that, man. So basically, the whole talk is just about like, if you can send cam messages, what can you do? And it's this chart that shows all the things that you couldn't do since 2010 vehicles. Um, now you can basically do. Another reason stop brakes or make brakes not work is on there. Uh, is on there. We never had firmware for it, and they're the root source of trust for speed. They actually know the speed because they know how fast the wheels are spinning. Right. So you can fake out all the other modules how fast they're going, but the brakes actually know for real, not from the CAN bus. Um, and we know, and the Chrysler never updated the the ABS system, so we couldn't steal the firmware that way. And we're not smart enough to get it off the hardware itself. No, no. And we're not risky enough to log in with our own private key. <laughs> uh, which we had. Of yeah, yeah, which we had. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, wh what can you do? And we've, I think we've mentioned this in every set of slides that we've ever done for the past four years or however long it's been. Um, there should be some kind of protection or detection mechanism or logging. Like, you at least want to know if this, something like this happened, right? And to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. Like, I, I know there's the black box with airbag deployments, but, like, shouldn't you log why the power, steer, the power steering module, like, went off or was getting bad messages or something? Right. Right? And we, we prototyped one of these. We, we made a device that would learn about the CAN bus quickly, and then if it deviates, uh, if the traffic deviates, uh, could so prevent and detect attacks. No we attack. did this a long time ago, too. Like, what, two years ago, we presented the yeah. same stuff. You see, we're still in the Ford, so it had to be years ago at this point. So here's the brakes that are not working trick. I'm out on a very secure area here. So obviously, <laughs> that's a very secure test track. track. So uh, um, I'm going to turn on the detector here. So all this thing does, it's like the most stupid, dumb algorithm you can right imagine. It just figures out what network. rate to expect messages, so and if it sees something that right falls out of that, right. uh, whether that's something new, like a diagnostic message, or us flooding the network or something, it just notices now, that, and then it shuts off again, the CAN bus. Run the same attack. Even in the most simple example, attack right, where we're, we're just attack. changing the I speed, there's work. double the speed messages so that you normally see. So it's pretty easy to tell when things have gone awry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's like, and even these new, like, attacks that we've been talking to you about in the last hour, they're still detected by this, like, most naive yeah, algorithm you can Yeah, everything we've done and everything, every attack that anyone's ever done, the little device that we made up works and detects them. So, um, everyone always says, hey, use encryption. We saw we can get the keys out of the ECUs, we can get keys out of the mechanics tools. Uh, it's, it's a key management problem, and it doesn't really solve anything. Even in the remote vector, um, we leveraged existing code within a firmware to send messages, so that encryption would be abstracted to us if you pop the car remotely. Um, yes, it would make it harder if just to plug in and sniff something, but it, it doesn't really give you anything. Right. So the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So then uh, let's like wrap this thing up. up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. The, only, the one thing about this whole attack, though, that, that I have to say it really makes me question whether it was a big deal or not, yeah. is you, this was like hard and you needed to have a car for a while. Like, it <sighs> seems like a... I don't even know how you could get a car. I know. Maybe you could buy one from some kind of distributor <laughs> of cars. We're just making fun. This is what Chrysler's response to this <laughs> research was. was uh, they're like, yeah, you, you would have to actually like, do some work and figure out how things work in a car. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yes. you need a car-to-car -car hack. No shit. Uh, it's going to take you time to do it, but once you do it once, you know, we can go to another Jeep right now and, and, and do it again. Right. Um, and, and then, like, yeah, so all these attacks would have worked that, you know, if, if you had some a remote attack, they would have worked against, you know, whatever car, like Jeeps or whatever, anything by Chrysler, and, and it's not like something that's been patched, and it would have worked in a 2016 exactly. or whatever. We, we need to apply the methodologies we use for our corporate IT environments, cars, right? We need code signing. You need intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. Um, these are concepts we already understand very well uh, at that level, so, like, let's see that happen. You also need code signing, right? So, yeah. like, real code signing, not two-byte checksums. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, let's, let's get these protections in place. Lastly, we're done. What, five, five papers, thousands of lines of code, dozens of samples, crazy-ass videos. Someone else pick it up. I think, I think we did, a, did our part. 
Uh, we're going to hang up car hacking, but everyone else should continue to do it. And honestly, it's not a tools problem or figuring out message problems. As you see here, it's a reverse engineering problem. We want to figure out how more firmwares work, and maybe attacks we have are universal to a bunch of cars. We don't know, but it takes a lot of time, and uh, I think we're we're done we're done doing that. So it's fun. Get involved. Do yeah. it. Like get your car, hack on it. Yeah. Um, special thanks to IOActive who let us keep the Jeep, even though Chris quit. <laughs> um, and kept kept hacking on it. Uh, one thing I want to tell them is sorry about all the yeah, parking sorry tickets. Sorry about those parking tickets, I owe. I, I wasn't gonna pay him, so uh, <laughs> not your car. Nope. That's it. Thanks, That's guys. It. Thanks. Gun. <laughs> I didn't know it was, high, it was uh, <laughs> Top Gun. Yeah, it's always Top Gun.